welcome to the Debka File, a weekly roundup of exclusive news, insight, and analysis from the Middle East, broadcast to you live from the heart of the region. Coming up on the program today, why Israel has slowed operations in Gaza and Syria, Iran to resume uranium enrichment, the new Saudi UAE pact backed by the U.S. launches a Houdeda offensive. The oil state's bailout for Jordan has strings attached. Russia compels Hezbollah to yield ground. And now to our top headlines. The IDF is not treating the Palestinians' flaming kite attacks and balloon assaults, which have been scorching acres of Israeli farmlands each day, as terror. On Monday, the IDF launched nine airstrikes against Hamas military compounds in Gaza, but not at the Palestinians who have been producing the deadly kites. IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant Gadi Eisenkot rejected the cabinet minister's demand to treat these attacks as terrorism, believing that there is a legal problem in defining kites and balloons as a threat to life. This was the first time that the IDF consulted lawyers before launching a military operation for defending the country. Following the IDF strikes, which demolished Iranian military bases in Syria, there's been a silence on Israel's northern front. Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and General Gadi Eisenkot decided to hold their fire during the World Cup soccer finals in Russia. Russian President Vladimir Putin reportedly asked Netanyahu to hold off on attacks in Syria until the games were over. This pause in Israel's attacks allowed Iran the time it needed to fix the demolished military facilities and import new weapons to replace the damaged ones. Israel is holding back from using its superior high-tech forces against Hamas's terror by arson and Iran's resupply of its damaged bases in Syria during the World Cup finals. A graph showing the decline of Palestinian terrorist operations over the past three years, as well as a map displaying the Iranian military lineup in Syria, was exhibited by Prime Minister Netanyahu at the Homeland Security Forum last week, attended by 20 countries. He stated that Israel owes its successes to advanced radar systems capable of reading the target's intentions and providing warnings of upcoming attacks. One tool, called FOPIN, created by ELTA Systems, detects targets from several kilometers away through thick foliage while exposing secret Palestinian terrorist drills or preparations for attacks in remote areas surrounded by dense vegetation. This system also has been used on the Syrian and Lebanese borders to detect Hezbollah units. With us to discuss this is Dr. Martin Sherman, director of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me again. Is the Army's decision to refrain from attacking kite and balloon crews sustainable in light of the huge damage caused by toys used as weapons? Well, I must admit that the, the reticence displayed by the IDF is very disturbing and in the long run probably uh, counterproductive. It's especially uh, disturbing when it comes from the Army, when the Army is basically is the element that's holding back because, you know, why should the other side stop using these weapons if they don't have to pay an exorbitant price? Um, and I, I, I really think this is, this is a poor decision. And, uh, you, know, you know, there's a, a political algorithm which many democracies fall uh, prey to. When there is a display of violence, they confront it with proportional, i.e. minimal force, which uh, doesn't really deter, but merely immunates against fear of the other side. And so then the next time there's a round of violence, it's at a higher level. And again, you confront it this time with proportionate minimal force, but only higher than before. And this way you'll find that the violence is going to spiral out of control and eventually reach levels which a much more firm, a much firmer uh, response would probably have uh, uh, prevented at the beginning. Do you think people will start evacuating the devastated areas? Well, I, I, I think this is... Uh, a tangible possibility. I've been warning for a long time now that there'll either be Arabs in Gaza or Jews in, in, in the Negev. Uh, there won't be both. Um, but, uh, you know, the IDF must de de uh, defend its citizens. And it's, it seems a little um, strange that the IDF 
is worried about uh, an escalation rather than the Hamas, given the huge imbalance in the forces. And uh, I think this shows the, the futility of uh, the Israeli policy of trying to manage the conflict, um, you know, and hoping for the Palestinians to morph into something that they haven't been for 100 years and show little sign of morphing into in the foreseeable future. So I, I think the, the, the IDF has to treat the Palestinians as an implacable enemy and not a prospective peace, a peace partner. And I think that's the only way some kind of effective uh, policy will emerge. Because you've seen over the years, we, we, the Palestinians have tried certain measures. We found countermeasures. They found another thing. You know, they had suicide bombers, so we had a barrier, a fence. Uh, so then they had rockets, and we developed the Iron Dome. And then they had tunnels, so we're now digging a 40-meter deep uh, barrier. And now they're flying kites over it. And every measure that we will... We will uh, 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 Every, every measure we will take, they'll find some countermeasure to overcome. And so I think what you have to go for is a total victory. The, the, the solution for Gaza, as uh, unpalatable as it might sound, is the, not the reconstruction, but the deconstruction. Moving to the northern borders now, do you think Israel's withholding all moves on the northern borders has been a strategic decision? Well, that may well be. I mean, you know, the, the situation in the north is very different from the situation in the south. In the north, the main actors there are state actors, principally uh, Russia, uh, Iran, and to a certain degree, Syria. And I think the important element in that equation is coordination with Russia. And, uh, you know, and Netanyahu seems to have skillfully set up some kind of rapport with Putin, which is crucial. And uh, if it means delaying attacks for two or three weeks until the World Cup is over, um, I think that's probably a wise decision. Why do you think Netanyahu was receptive to Putin's demands, knowing that Iran would undo the damage caused by Israeli strikes? Well, you know, I I'm not quite sure what the reports uh, telling us that uh, Iran has uh, undone the damage. I mean, there was serious damage, and I'm not quite sure that it's all been been uh, repaired and you know, why would they do that if they know it's so exposed and they've been uh, you know it's also shown such a, a great superiority and Iran has a lot of domestic problems at home so you, you know as I said before if this pause keeps Putin as amenable as he's been up to now it's probably worth the delay how feasible are U.S. or Israeli strikes against Iran's enrichment sites at Fordo or Natanz, both of which are underground? Well, you know, I don't really have uh, up-to-date operational intelligence on how hard the targets are and what capacity uh, the U.S. and Israel has to breach them. But in general principle, I think it's completely inconceivable to think that the U.S. could not inflict enough damage on Iran to get it to back away or even threaten enough damage to get Iran to back away. I don't know if it's, don't know if it's necessary to actually uh, destroy the specific sites, but if you can threaten or even destroy the infrastructure, their bridges, the power stations, the, 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 the rails, the railway lines, their uh, fuel, de uh, fuel depots, I think that would be a credible, uh, a credible threat that Iran would not be able to uh, resist. That's Dr. Martin Sherman. Thank you very much for your insight today. Thank you. Iran warned that it would leave the nuclear accord unless benefits are underway. An atomic energy official in Tehran has stated that uranium enrichment would resume at the Fordo plant. Iranian President Rouhani has issued a warning to French President Emmanuel Macron that uranium enrichment would proceed. The Iranian president issued this statement. The Islamic Iran مطابق برجام عمل کرده و سازمان انرژی اتمی تا کنون 11 بار پایبندی ایران را به این تعهدات تایید نموده تمامی اعضای برجام در قبال تعهدات رفع تحریمی پذیرفته شده در برجام مسئولیت دارند و سایر اعضای ملل متحد نیز بر اساس قطنامه 2231 شورای امنیت و ماده 25 منشور ملل متحد موظفند که به اجرای کامل برجام کمک نمایند و از هر اقدامی که مانع اجرای برجام بشه خودداری کنند جمهوری اسلامی ایران فرصت محدودی را در اختیار کشورهای باقی مانده در برجام قرار داده 
تا چنانچه در عمل بتوانند نسبت به اجرای تمامی موارد توافق شده در برجام تضمین لازم را ارائه نمایند. On Wednesday, Iran's Atomic Energy Organization spokesman Beiruz Kamalvandi stated that based on the orders of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, new work would begin on the nuclear program. Kamalvandi stated that, quote, the Supreme Leader has ordered that the programs be carried out within the parameters of the nuclear deal, and when he gives the order, we will announce the programs for operating outside the nuclear deal for reviving Fordow. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi had this to say about the statements from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, Debkafile reports that the Fordow plant is equipped with 8,000 advanced centrifuges, which are capable of churning out 20 PC-grade uranium, which is required to make nuclear weapons. At Natanz, Iran's second-largest enrichment site, the equipment includes high-speed IR-6 centrifuges. The Iranian Atomic Energy Organization statement served several purposes. First, it made clear that Iran is unconcerned about the results of the U.S.-North Korean summit for denuclearization between U.S. President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Second, it was in response to Trump's comment following the summit, in which he said that Iran is in a different place compared to three months ago. Tehran made sure to communicate that they would continue on their nuclear path, going against Trump's strategy. The Fordow facility is difficult to destroy and is designed to resist attacks. Following a 2012 attempt to disrupt the plant by sabotaging its power supply, an independent power station was installed underground. Debka military sources report that despite these obstacles, Israel and the U.S. may have prepared military operations to strike Fordow. Saudi Arabian and UAE forces captured the Hudaydah airport from the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels on Saturday. This was the third day of their offensive to capture the town. Their success is significant for several reasons. The assault force for capturing the airport is made up of 25,000 Yemeni army units who oppose the Houthi insurgency. Yemeni jets now can no longer bring in reinforcements to help the 2,000 Houthi fighters ward off the Saudi UAE assault. According to Debka Files' exclusive military sources, the Iranian-backed Houthi movement has been ridden with strife in the past year, which has led to assassinations of faction chiefs. U.S. President Trump, who considers Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Ziyad as allies, gave them the green light to go forward with the Hudayda operation, which includes intelligence for marking targets, weapons for air force and artillery units, and refueling for coalition air raids. U.N. and European agencies attempted to prevent the offensive by threatening that it would cut the lifeline of the 22 million Yemenis who rely on the seaport through which humanitarian aid reaches the country. The civil war in Yemen has caused millions to die of starvation. This was made worse during the Houthis' control of Hudaydah and the port, as there was no one to distribute incoming food to the needy. Removing the Houthis from the town will open the channels for assistance to reach the helpless population. Wasin Ahmed, a spokesperson for the Yemeni government's High Committee of Humanitarian Relief, issued this statement. وإحنا ضربت خمس سفن تجارية وإغاثية في عرض البحر وفجرت مخازن برنامج الغذاء العالمي في محافظة الحديدة أربع مخازن تم تفجيرها وأدى إلى إتلاف خمسة ألف طن من تلك المساعدات الإغاثية. Saudi Arabia has made clear that after liberating the town from the Iran-backed insurgency, they would assist the UN in giving care to the needy population. Iranian support for the Houthi movement was exaggerated and was nowhere near the support they gave to the Lebanese Hezbollah. Hudaydah's fall to Saudi UAE forces would be a military win over Tehran, which had plans to set up its Red Sea naval base at the Yemeni port. 
The offensive was launched after Saudi Arabia and the UAE established a new Gulf organization called the Saudi Emirati Coordination Council. Through this new establishment, the two crown princes, along with President Donald Trump, will be able to call the shots in the Gulf. يتقدمون بمبادرة إنسانية جديدة تهدف إلى تكثيف وصول المساعدات الإنسانية والإغاثية عبر الحديدة لتشمل كامل المناطق المحررة من قبضة الميليشيات الحوثية المدعومة من إيران وغيرها من المناطق since the Jordanian protests toward the government, three Gulf Arab governments have vowed to contribute $2.5 billion to stabilize the kingdom. This package was created at a meeting in Mecca on June 11th by Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and the United Arab Republic and will go towards Jordan's central bank to alleviate the $700 million budget deficit. Debka sources state that there was an interview between King Salman, Crown Prince Mohammed and King Abdullah in which they agreed on strict conditions in exchange for the assistance. The terms of the agreement are as follows. Abdullah must stop the anti-Saudi propaganda campaign. Every royal, civil, economic, financial and military body in Jordan must join forces with Saudi Arabia and the UAE against Qatar. The Jordanian Army, Air Force, and military intelligence will play a role in the Saudi-UAE military coalition fighting the Yemeni Houthi insurgency. King Abdullah must downgrade the operations of the Muslim Brotherhood, blocking their ties in other parts of the Middle East, including Turkey, as well as restricting their communication outlets. King Abdullah must cut ties with Syria's Bashar al-Assad and must stop seeking political and military assistance. He must also cut ties with Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas and follow Egypt, Saudi Arabia and the UAE in treating Palestinians as an obstacle to Trump's potential Middle East peace plan. Debka sources report that King Abdullah had no choice but to accept the terms of this agreement. Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah stated last Friday that no one but the Syrian government can ask them to leave. He also claimed that Israel is failing in its attempts to get Iranian and Hezbollah troops out of the country. Devka military sources report that in the past several days, Russian forces have gotten the Lebanese Shiite Hezbollah forces in Syria to abandon Aleppo and Kenetra, opposite Israel's Golan border. In Aleppo, Hezbollah has provided the Syrian government's army with the only ground force for attacking the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic forces in the north. This follows President Assad's promise in May to attack unless they withdraw from the country. Assad's threat was followed by a warning from the Pentagon and Russia, which have agreed to take action to ward off Assad from the region. Washington then ordered the USS Harry Truman Navy aircraft carrier to take a position on Syria's Mediterranean coast. Russia commanders who fear a U.S. Hezbollah clash gave Hezbollah commanders an ultimatum to withdraw from Aleppo. Hezbollah was responsive and sent its troops to Damascus, leaving Assad without ground forces to attack the U.S. outpost. In Kenetra, Hezbollah deployed the Iraqi Shiite brigade of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, a militia under Iranian Revolutionary Guard's command, to supplement its own Golan Brigade units. Israel warned Moscow that if the pro-Iranian units did not immediately evacuate from Kenetra, the IDF would attack. Prime Minister Netanyahu had this to say at the International Homeland Security Forum conference. Putting in Shiite militias, understand that Syria is 96% Sunni. So when they bring in 80,000 Shiites, one of their goals is not merely attacking Israel, but their goal is to convert the Sunnis. That is a recipe for a reinflammation of another civil war, I should say a theological war, a religious war. And the sparks of that could be millions more that go into Europe and so on and elsewhere. And that would cause endless upheaval and terrorism in many, many countries. By preventing that, and we have bombed the bases of this, uh, these Shiite militias, by preventing that, we're also offering, helping uh, the security of your countries, the security of the world. And now for a weekly roundup of this week's regional stories you may have missed, the News in Brief. The Museum for Islamic Art in Jerusalem is featuring a Hamsa exhibit, featuring 555 hand-shaped symbols. 
The exhibit explores the significance of the Khamsa in modern society. The ancient symbol is used to bring luck and good health and is featured in the exhibit on pendants, tableware, clothes, and religious items. The Israeli company Barclays Accelerator will partner with 11 companies to make progress in the fields of cybersecurity and financial technology. The program will run for 13 weeks and will culminate with companies pitching ideas to investors. The Barclays Accelerator was launched in 2014 and is managed by Israeli entrepreneur Hila Ovil Brenner. It is a unique partnership between the British multinational bank and Techstars, which offers an array of resources and mentors to founders of startups in the fields of cybersecurity, insurance technology, and enterprise software. That's all for this week's edition of The Depka File. We'll be back with you next week for exclusive news, insight, and analysis from the Middle East. Thanks for watching.